Okay. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, say hello to everyone. A lot of people today, uh, and they're still coming. So uh, we have uh, Mario Shestak with us uh, from Born Fight uh, from Zagreb. And uh, he'll talk about some practical typography with some tips, tricks, and uh, everything around. <laughs> and uh, I'll leave an uh, introduction to, to Mario and uh, uh, have great fun and uh, have a great time. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mikhail. Uh, let me just uh, quickly share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you'll see this. All right. Okay, now, now we see your share. Hey, okay, now it's great. You see it? Yeah. It's good? Perfect. Okay. Hope you're everybody's going doing great. Uh, I will be talking this, uh, having this uh, whole presentation on English. Uh, creation is my native language, and it's much easier to to talk about creation. But for our English friends, I will continue just on uh, English. First, before we jump into today's subject, uh, I will just shortly uh, make introduction uh, of myself, of Stel. Um I'm Mario Shestak, uh, head of design, currently working at uh, company Bornfight. Uh, Bornfight is a digital agency where, I don't know, passionate people with similar values uh, build websites, branding, uh, software products, and mobile apps. Um, I was like drawn from a very young age uh, to everything visual. Uh, Eventually, typefaces came later, but uh, I always like wanted to explore something new. I was very curious as a person. This is me, uh, this uh, colorful guy with very cool glasses. Um, and I started working uh, in graphic design. This was uh, like my first computer, not the actual photo of my computer. But at that time, when I started the designing, uh, it was uh, like I think 56K or something internet connection and like very old uh, machines. Uh, probably my machine or my computer at that time was even shittier than this one. Uh, the resolutions were low, like uh, 860 pixels per 600 pixels. And yeah, at that time was totally different uh, way of working and the web, web as a medium was quite new. I designed my first, let's say, commercial website that I get paid to do in 2005. Uh, at that time, the flash as a technology was uh, very popular, as you see. I've used uh, Flash Action Script 2.0 and pixel fonts. Uh, pixel fonts at that time on that resolutions were pretty, pretty popular. Um, it was like whole movement with pixel fonts and you can really you know trade with other designers uh, with some particular fonts to to have this uh, pixel feel uh it was much much uh harder to find good fonts especially the the pixel ones uh, but at that time i was really starting to uh, learn my craft so i was trying to learn more about Photoshop, Dreamweaver, Flash, and all of these programs. And at that time, I started to transfer my uh, focus on web, like the new technologies at that time, uh, HTML and CSS. So I also did some coding at that time. Uh, fast forward uh, in the future uh, from that, that, that period, uh, uh, now I as I said, uh, lead a design team in Bonfight, uh, where the designers are divided in three units, a product unit, mobile unit, and a creative unit, uh, where every unit is focused uh, in particular area based on project type. Is it a product development uh, project or more of a creative project or just a mobile platform project? Uh, sometimes we work uh, as a team like together and sometimes uh, separately. Also, um, I'm a mentor. I try to share my knowledge whenever I can. Um, I'm 
making sure that uh, the team that I'm leading is developing in the right direction. Uh, my goal is to set the vision and help the team to move forward with that vision. Uh, I also like to teach and share my knowledge on whenever I can uh, on meetups, uh, conferences, uh, universities, or even like this remote kind of things after Corona started. Um, I really believe that uh, sharing this knowledge is uh, important and it's, it's a way to give back to the community. When I started, it was more of a, like designers were separated and they were keeping their secrets from, for themselves because I, I think that uh, probably we were thinking if anybody else knew our secrets or our sources or anything, they will be better designer uh, than ourselves. I'm totally against this idea today because I really, really believe that when, our, when we are transferring that knowledge and sharing the knowledge that we have, we are even growing more and we are very going in detail in that, uh, I don't know, topic or, or, or area we are trying to uh, bring to the people. Uh, in my personal free time, I was a traveler. I really, really enjoyed traveling. This was like before Corona time. You all know what it's like uh, when when Corona came and everything is just like closed, no traveling. I enjoyed very much traveling because it was like time for me to just set, set back, uh, unwind and have my time for myself to think about anything from private stuff, from the life, from the, I don't know, work stuff, whatever it, it's in, in the... Um, Okay, so today's topic is practical topography. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in conversation with Mihail before, it was like a very short uh, or blitzkrieg combination of how to assemble this presentation and what to 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 tell the community and what what is valuable to to transfer that knowledge. And I come up with the idea to talk about topography that is practical, that can be useful, and like a way how I approach topography. And it's separated in three parts, uh, aesthetics, function, and practice. Uh, in aesthetics parts, we'll talk about more abstract stuff, that is uh, the aesthetics of typography. Uh, this subject, of the aesthetics, it's more abstract and it's harder to grasp. It's harder to maybe learn, but it's not impossible. Function, on the other hand, is completely different beast. It's mostly with how uh, we are using typefaces based on their characteristics. For example, if we need a typeface for a particular purpose and we need, let's say, uh, a language support of any kind and this functional part is uh, teaching us what we do we need to look in the typefaces uh, when we are choosing typefaces or combining typeface for a project what is the details that we need to be aware of and what we do we need to search for and the final thing uh, the third part is practice this is something that uh, i would just want to uh, maybe share the knowledge or mindset that I have with practice because everything from the aesthetic part and the functional part uh, falls apart if we don't use or try or practice that some the things that we learned. Uh, I, I'm a strong, strong believer in, in uh, practice that's not just for typography but also for design. Uh, I always make uh, this comparison between the uh, people uh, who are in some kind of a sport, let's say basketball, and they are practicing and they are shooting hoops on the basketball court, and they are practicing. They are really, really, it's not the real situation, it's not the, the, the game, but they are really, you know, making their effort and practicing. And when they go on in the game, they apply that knowledge and this knowledge uh, became becomes part of them so the same it's in design and in typography if we practice 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 
when we go on a project on or our game we apply this knowledge much better we apply these principles or thinking or ways of doing it that we tried and failed and maybe experimented in practice and we can easier much we can easier apply those uh principles in a real project we are more effective so let's start with the uh, aesthetics as i mentioned the first part um so knowing how to choose and use a typeface based on aesthetic characteristics is super important uh when we have technical aspects uh, they ensure that typeface can perform very well in different scenarios. And it's much easier to learn than the aesthetic, aesthetic uh, characteristics. This is why, this is because uh, aesthetics is more abstract, it's more emotional. It's uh, more how do you feel about certain typefaces or certain design. Uh, the good news is that it's it can be developed as like any other skill. Uh, but as I mentioned, it requires a lot of practice, different approaches, learning, observing, and again, practicing. I cannot uh, emphasize practice uh, enough. So the aesthetic part, um, it comes to the, the following your gut feeling. And for a beginner, that sucks when somebody tells you follow your gut feeling because you don't trust your gut feeling and you don't have it, uh, you don't see it so clear. The, this is why I'm, I will try to give you maybe some insights uh, that can help you with when you will uh, apply these principles or insights uh, in your research or in your observation of the typefaces. So. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is personality. And when we talk, look at the typefaces, uh, every typeface has a personality and uh, it has some kind of a voice. The uh, when we look at the branding or brands, they have certain personality or they have certain voice. The typography plays a huge role in, in that voice. Uh, as we know, or as we uh, assume, uh, typography plays a huge role in every design. This is the written, la written language, the words that are written, and they are communicating not just by essence or the content, but also on subconscious subconscious level. They are communicating visually. They transmit some kind of a feeling or, as I mentioned, voice. So they have personality. When we look at the brands, for example, this is a one example of a brand that is very, very direct. It's loud, it's in its daring. And you can see it from the typography standpoint that they are like in a way raw and how they apply their thinking, not just by the whole brand and visual uh, co uh, communication, but the typography that plays a huge role, the, the personality or tone of voice of that typography, it's very aligned with the communication that they are trying to achieve as a brand. They want to perceive, be perceived as honest, loud, daring, and very like straightforward brand. So no bullshit brand, uh, as, as we say. Uh, on the other hand, when we look at uh, Kinfolk, uh, this is more of a sophisticated kind of uh, brand. It's uh, recognizable for their aesthetics. Uh, when you look at their visuals or overall aesthetics, they are very calm or mellow, and the typography is same in that direction presented. Uh, when we talk about typography, we are not, uh, or expression within the brands, we are not talking about just one typeface is that is uh, for for example like in vice example they have like uh, one one typeface or maybe few widths or weights that they're using but this is aligned with their expression they want to be straightforward raw and they will probably use less of a fluff 
products, let's let's call it like that. And for example, when you compare it to Kinfolk, they are more of a sophisticated and then they need to have this uh, contrasting moments and this, uh, like, let's say, calm communication. This is not just about the design elements and how they are placed, but I'm just mostly talking about uh, in between typography and the whole brand, how they are approaching it. If you look at more examples of the brand, it's, it's not just the typography, it's the visuals. Um, and also how we com use a certain typeface or let's say choose uh, uh, let's, the, most, the, the, the main typeface of a kinfolk and what are the other typefaces that we're combining with this main type, type, typeface? And what is the whole overall visual message? This is the, the goal of, let's say, creating a personality for a brand. Sometimes we, will, we can use only one typeface. Sometimes we will use multiple typefaces. But if we are using multiple typefaces, they need to be aligned, combined in a certain way. And more, more importantly, typeset. Uh, in a way that they reflect the brand values. Uh, if you look at the, this, this example, the typesetting, the contrast, the sizes, the letter spacing in between, you can see that they are addressing these values that we, we as a user, when we look at this brand with combined with uh, photography, they get, give us a whole picture. They are elegant, sophisticated, and calm. Okay, so when we are talking about typefaces, uh, every typeface could have a personality. So they have a message. They are trying to say something to us. This message can be, in this example, masculine or feminine that is more, let's, let's say, uh, sophisticated, uh, high contrast in this, in this case, uh, contemporary, or maybe just historic. Just in this example, that is maybe overly saturated example, just to um, give you a, a point of view, uh, every typeface within itself, depending on era from where it came or depending on construction, how is it made, has already built in personality. So when we are combining typefaces, uh, we need to be aware of that personality that is already built in. These examples are maybe extended examples just to show the, the main idea, but most of the, the examples of personality in a typeface are more subtle. So it's harder to uh, recognize them and we need to be aware when we are choosing the typefaces and especially combining the typefaces within. Here, I want to show you how Besides the personality, uh, some typefaces can have a mood, so a different feeling or different vibe they want to communicate. Uh, this is the these are the examples of the same typeface. It's the, the typeface is called Founders Grotesque, and here I will show you some of the examples how this typeface is, is used and with let's say successful typesetting and context they transmit a different mood. Uh, let's say Obladaya coffee uh, compared to British Academy. It's the same typeface, but with a different setting, different mood. And they're like used, probably it's the same family. I mean, it's the same family, not probably. Uh, we are using, let's say, more elegant solution for lighter uh, type, uh, lighter uh, weights compared to this bold one that are combined with secondary typeface that gives overall feel or, or something, uh, let's say, more serious, but also com contemporary. In this example, it's also same same typeface, typeset differently. We are using different let, um, approaches or different typesetting uh, methodologies or ideas how to communicate with the same typefaces, same typeface, the different mood. Another example, where is more bolder example and more, let's say, direct, direct one. You see the connection between the vice brand and, and this one. 
it's more of a let's say raw or uh, basic kind of example whenever so this is the the founders grotesque uh, typeface and this example is used in uh, different industries it can fit different purposes so our assignment as a designer is to not only to find typeface that has very uh, noticeable personality like in those masculine and feminine examples but more to find these subtle examples and then bend the typeface with the typesetting so how we bend the typeface we choose appropriate uh, size weight width whatever is in our this disposal that we can use from this typeface and we use this typeface in a certain way in this example it's everything is uppercase and it gives a different vibe uh, than let's say in previous example that is also uppercase but it's different weight so we are having a different messaging and we introduced the color as well and we got totally different feeling so typefaces it, as itself are not like standalone ones of or let's say they're they're not uh, holding the whole branding they are and they could in some examples but most of the times we are combining them with different design elements it, it, this is color imagery or whatever and with, when we combine the, all of these elements we got context we got total feeling of uh, brand another example that's for national museum of uh, republic mission museum the next thing when we talked about personality and mood the content why is content important because we want to first find the typefaces that match our let's say keywords or direction of a design or a particular message that we want to communicate the next thing that we are ne really need to go into is the content or the structure so we really need to go in immerse ourselves in the in the content of a project that we are working on uh, no matter if this is a just a brochure or a mobile application or website or whatever we are doing when we are examining or finding typefaces we really need to also understand the essence i'm not just talking about uh, we need to understand the the brief goals of the project goals or the vision or what we need to to achieve or the user needs everything this is important but i'm talking here more of uh let's say the essence of, of of a particular project if we are designing for example for some company that is i don't know uh consult consultation company we really need to understand how they operate or what they are their services or unique selling point and in this point when we are let's say choosing typefaces or examining typefaces that can be very good for this project the really good approach is to dive into content we will get more of that uh, if it's done right tone of voice and communication that this brand stands how the the sentences are structured what is the let's say mood or character how this brand is speaking and what is the essence and also while going through that essence we get a lot of ideas about the structure uh, structure that is typographic structure how many maybe type of uh, content do we have do we need a multiple uh, hierarchy within the typography do we need a lot of lists is this something that is content heavy that we will need to set up a really big and wide uh, typographic scale or whatever these are some kind of insights that uh, when we are relying on this aesthetic point of view we are trying to understand the the project or brand more no matter if i'm just uh, following myself up uh, no matter if this is a web mobile app or social media whatever we need to understand this essence the next thing um, is inspiration and this is something that is 
feeding our aesthetic point of view. We cannot expect from ourselves that we will have a good aesthetic uh, taste if we don't feed ourselves with uh, good design, good type, good typesetting. So when we are trying to, uh, let's say, uh, sharpen our skill in typography or in design, we need to inspire ourselves. Also, we need to be careful not to overdo it. I will come to this subject a little bit later. But the first thing that most of designers think about inspiration, they go to dribble awards or site, site inspire or whatever these kind of uh, inspirational sites. Um, I think that it's a good way to find inspiration in medium that you are not working in. For example, if you are working in a uh, print medium, try to find your inspiration uh, outside of this medium. For example, I'm working in digital or web uh, medium and my best choices or go-to places for inspirations are outside of this medium. That doesn't mean that I'm not using this medium for inspiration, but I'm, tr I'm trying at least to have this kind of inspiration uh, to be in a majority. So books are also a very nice uh, example of uh, inspiration. Uh, you can find really nice and different way of thinking, especially because this medium is uh, here for a long time already, and they really expanded uh, their uh, experimentation and maybe design language and whatever. And web's, web is influenced by that medium. Why not go to the source and try to find inspiration there? The second uh, thing is to narrow that, that search. If you are working on a project that is uh, has some particular vibe or needs to communicate a particular message or has a particular art direction or future design direction, try to find or inspiration in books that are from different era. Maybe that era is connected with the, this message that you are trying to achieve with this project. So other choice or uh, direction of example is try to uh, examine books in a, from different era. Is it uh, more of a, a something psychedelic from the 60s or it's a more of a Bauhaus? You, you be the, the judge, but this is also a good way to see how the people uh, experimented, worked with type at that uh, period. You will find very, very nice examples and very inspirational stuff. Second thing, uh, this is my uh, also obsession in a way. I also examine uh, two things when I go abroad traveling, not this year. Uh, I look at newspapers. This is something that I usually find either in uh, airplanes or uh, trains. Usually it's like free new, uh, newspaper. I like to, even I don't understand the language, I try to see how they are uh, typeset it and how they are using typography and what's the, uh, let's say, uh, standard for their that country. Because the language is different and the typefaces are also kind of different. And also the signage. You have a lot of signage uh, from the street signage to the commercial signage, and they are quite, quite inspirational. If you go on Pinterest and just type in, sorry, signage, and let's say uh, Italian old signage, uh, coffee shops or whatever, you will find amazing typography and really nice examples that can be uh, like a corner store for your next project or direction you want to take. So this is a good example too. Uh, the the next example is films. Uh, I'm not a big film person. I'm more of a, like I don't uh, find time for films. Sometimes I do, uh, but I'm not too patient uh, when, I, when it comes to uh, watching movies. I like to skip as well. Uh, some people also uh, I know that uh, they don't have patience to to watch watch them. I know it's a blasphemy for for the film people. So <laughs> sorry about that. But something that I am more uh, have uh, my eye on is uh, intro and outro credit, credits and how they're using typography there. It's like you have the, this art direction through typography uh, 
to this particular theme of a Siri or, um, or a Moody. So there are also a lot of examples, very nice examples there. Uh, and then again, we move to this more digital environment that is more popular and known to us. Pinterest is a very nice place, um, not just for examining and uh, researching typefaces and inspiration for design and everything, but uh, this is a very, for me, valuable place where I can uh, organize things, organize typefaces or by need or by purpose or by projects or by medium, whatever. Most of them from on my profile are hidden or, or locked, but I need to, to share them just to, to be open more in this collaborative manner. Uh, but yeah, Pinterest is a very nice uh, place to, to find inspiration when we cover these uh, offline uh, purposes. Uh, save it. This is a, I'm not, I'm not sure it's, is it a po so much popular pl platform? Um, I have a, a love and hate relationship with this platform because um, in a way, if you, you are selecting this, if you are selecting this uh, a particular style that you are interested in, you will only see or following people who are also similar uh, taste level like you or uh, aiming to certain directions, you will get this kind of results. So you are some kind of some kind of a trap in a loop. Uh, and there, there are no, let's say, suggestions like on Pinterest. So this is why I don't like it. And also I love it because of that, because it's limiting and it has some kind of limitations. And in a way there, it's a, it's a good, good platform to keep uh, uh, inspiration in some kind of, a, I don't know, organizational thing. And also to find interesting typography or particular styles or people who are also collecting stuff and see what is their aesthetic or what is their taste. Um, the galleries as well, I will not uh, go so much into them. Like these are a few of them, awards, site inspire, uh, brutalist websites, whatever. There are like multiple galleries. This is just something that uh, I don't know, I came across that, that that's interesting. Regarding typefaces, if you want to broaden your aesthetic point of view when it comes to typefaces, you need to feed yourself in a daily basis to see what is current. Not because you need to follow that, but you because you need to understand it, uh, why this is uh, currently, let's say, hot or interesting, or why the design aesthetic is going in some certain direction, and what are the deviants of that direction, and who people are trying to uh, stand out of this, uh, let's say, uh, direction. Yeah, these, these are some examples that are interesting for me. Uh, these three three sites are uh, the cornerstone of my type research when I'm trying to find uh, typefaces and when I'm trying to learn about typefaces. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to develop aesthetic uh, style and your gut feeling when it comes to selecting typefaces for, for a particular purpose, first you need to understand a little bit about personality, try to uh, observe them as much as you can, and then see that observing and see that findings and compare the, compare them with maybe some uh, traditional approach uh, in the uh, type wolf typographical for the, in use on type type wolf you can find a different combinations so you can see what typefaces uh, work together and then you can try to figure out why they are working and why this aesthetic is interesting and why is this now very popular not because you need to follow this aesthetic but because you need to understand it if you want to develop a certain point of view in regards to aesthetics typographica is more of a, uh gives you more explanation about the, the certain typefaces uh, i like it because uh, the editors of typographica select certain typefaces and then write about it and uh, from their own perspective. So this is also a good uh, point of view or a good source to, to check the, uh, typography and as well to learn about typography. And fonts in use 
you can see if you find a particular typeface that you like and to see that mood or personality how does it feel before you test it before you try it before you said to yourself okay i will buy this typeface you can uh, examine it on Ponte News and see what other people have done with this particular typeface. And you can see if this, on a high level, if this matches with your mood of your future project. And of course, it's not galleries, but it's uh, type foundries. This is enormous source of inspiration and uh, aesthetic wise and also insp inspiration for information regarding the typefaces um, these are just few of them uh, hit me up and i will send you more link if you're interested uh, regarding the type foundries they have every type foundry has a particular aesthetic so for example clip type foundry all of the type designers have this similar not similar but uh, same vision or how typefaces should be constructed how they should be built and what are some kind of a uh, uh, like same you know, like you are working in a team in a company or studio or if you, if you are a freelancer if you have some partners that you hook up with and do design you are trying to find people that have similar values or beliefs in terms of design or at least similar aesthetics it's same with type foundries they're trying to find type typeface designers that have a particular view on how they construct typefaces and this view aligns with the view of this type foundry so it's also nice not only to to have this cohesive on co or consistent uh, style when you are choosing typefaces within the type foundry but also it's a good practice to combine the typefaces so if you need to combine typefaces and you are not very familiar with the construction and classification and all of that uh, then like a shortcut would be okay try to combine typefaces that are from the same type foundry or even go to try to combine typefaces that are from the same type designer because they are putting their soul and thinking in the construction of the typefaces and they have the similar values or or beliefs or vision how they should be constructed even they are different style we have sans serif typefaces or very expressive ones they 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 fit very good with uh let's say other typefaces that are more neutral from the same type designer because the essence or the construction is very similar so check the type founders as well and check these their blogs they are full of very good insights about choosing typefaces and type typography and all and uh, not just to finish this thing uh, with the research and inspiration uh, this is everything is useless if you don't have something from it if you don't try to combine it if you don't want to, if you don't organize it and if it's not uh, very close to you when you need it so let's say um, when you're doing research there are two kinds of research as we we internally call them one is ad hoc research and the second one is continuous at, at, uh, continuous research. Ad hoc research is you get a project, you need to go in this industry or this niche, and you need to find a particular typeface or aesthetic for this, this uh, industry. And then you try to find typefaces ad hoc while you are working on a project. It's much harder and the results are less good compared to continuous one if you're continuously let's say researching typefaces making your own lists based on whatever construction uh moods personality uh type in history whatever it's much easier to find good candidates for your purpose that you need it or you can extend or build upon this previous research with the new research with new findings from this particular project so yeah keep keep uh, some kind of a uh, uh, organization of that findings because all of your research is or inspiration is 
uh, useless because it's somewhere in back of your head. I mean, it's not completely use useless, but you know, you cannot do much uh, with it. And for the ad hoc research, I wouldn't say this is bad one or this is also needed, but it's best. It's best working when you combine it with this uh, continuous one. The second thing I want to show you that sometimes uh, with this organization, with I have links with typefaces that are divided in different groups. Um, I try to use some kind of a mood boards for particular uh, typefaces. Maybe I just write uh, I don't know uh, some basic information uh, or for purpose and show how this typeface uh, works in use. What is the let's say possibilities what is the vibe of this typeface how does it work what kind of a message can be uh what can what kind of a message can we get when we bend the typeface based on typesetting or whatever uh the next thing uh, or the next uh, part is the function and for the function i want to as i said it's much easier to to learn learn and uh, apply uh, principles of function than aesthetics but doesn't mean that uh, it's often applied good people ignore it or just forget about it and they uh, run into source uh, all all sorts of pro problems in the projects when they forget these kind of things uh, uh, basically they can break your design or whole project if you don't uh, think about them in the early stages by uh, this function or technical aspects i mean like uh, things like language support or uh, how they're rendering their quality uh, maybe their legibility if it's necessary for the particular uh, project or language support or whatever the critics whatever te technical requirements uh, can be so we'll just go through some of the things that uh, maybe you could uh, apply when you are examining typefaces mm, as i mentioned when you are looking typefaces for this from this aesthetic point of view and you are trying to um, see if the particular typefaces typeface matches your need or need of a project or need of a client or need of a, a user you also must not forget about the technical requirements that are easier to remember but often are just forget uh, overall so check for the number of weights when you are examining typefaces check the weights uh, most a lot of times happen to me i find a really nice typeface and try one two the weight put it in in the project and see it doesn't work and i have a need for a much larger scale because i haven't done my homework well and it's a project that it's that has a lot of content it's content heavy it's a publishing platform maybe and needs more flexibility and with weights we get flexibility and this is something that you need to be aware and check before you choose uh, typefaces typeface for a particular project I check for open type features uh, look for glyphs or special characters see the range uh, look at the uh, punctuation uh, marks uh, numerals uh, all of these things that can maybe be a mandatory for a project for example you are working uh, for a government project and uh, you are dealing with all, all sorts of numbers and you select a typeface that has a lot of weights it's super flexible it has language support it's nice but you haven't checked the glyphs or characters and they don't have let's say support for certain uh, characters or glyphs that you really need for that project you have a lot of numbers or numbers are not uh, tabular and basically you are having either difficulties with proceeding using that typefaces that can break your design or convincing client that this we need to change uh, uh, the typeface that we originally uh, estimated that will it will be when it comes to numbers this uh, proportional tabular thing i will just quickly go, go, go explain to it explain it 
Uh, so proportional uh, numbering is when the character width, so individual character, uh, uh, the width is varying according to their design. So we can have a uh, narrow width or wider width. This English is hard. Uh, the tabular one, the, this is the each character or this uh, uh, glyph occupies the same space. I will show you the example so you will see what I'm what I mean. Uh, and they are like vertically occupying this space. The old style, this is uh, let's say when we have uh, figures that or or numbers that are mimicking a lower cases within the x height uh, or ascenders and descenders, and they will probably so here are the numbers. So let's say one, two, blah blah blah, and they are like mimicking either x height or cap height so in a way they're very they're used when we need to align let's say wording with numbers we need we have a tendency in a project to use this and lining uh this means that the the uh they're used in numer numerical matter in combination with all caps let's just go to examples and i can i can show you an examples here we have like proportional and lining. Uh, proportional means that the, the widths are proportional. They can vary. They can, they can be bigger or smaller. Uh, so bigger and smaller. One is smaller, two is bigger. And they are lining. They are lining with the, the uppercase letters. Compared to, to, to old style, they are lined with X height. So this, this is what I was talking about. Some of them are aligned with X height and some of them they are on the cap height. So these are called old styles compared to lining. Everybody aligns to the uh, uppercase and on the old style, everybody, or sometimes they align on uh, X height and sometimes on uh, uppercase letters. Okay. The next one, this tabular or let's say monospaced they occupy the same uh, uh, amount of uh, space. So this uh, horizontal space is the same for every number. So this is very useful when we are dealing with a lot of numbers in our design, maybe for UI design, or let's say we have a lot of information in the numbers that they need to align in tables or in whatever we are using them. This fits much better. Uh, most of the typefaces that we're uh, choosing or using, and we are examining them, have this, uh, both of those, uh, let's say, uh, styles. Either they are lining or, sorry, tabular or proportional. So we, you can uh, switch between those depending on the need when we are using them. So keep an eye on, the, on that. Uh, other thing about the proportion that we need to uh, to, to check, so when we are trying to examine a particular typeface, we need to check the proportion between these, uh, let's say, related characters. Related characters are like N, M, H, or B, D, P. You get you get it, get it. So from this proportion, see how they are fitting together. And this is uh, probably more helpful when it comes to combining typefaces. For example. Uh, typefaces with similar proportions have a tendency to be more aesthetically uh, synced or aligned. They feel just much better. Second thing that we need to check, and especially for the language uh, thing, is word spacing. How the type, particular typeface that we selected, um, just let's say we are very uh, happy with the aesthetic point of view and, and the, the visual communication, and we are checking these uh, technical uh, characteristics. And one of the technical characteristics is word space. So try to put the typeface inside of the paragraph or multiple paragraphs in different sizes and see how does the, the word space work? How does, it, how does it feel? Because some of the typefaces have bigger or smaller word spaces. Uh, the thing about the proportions that uh, I was just uh, talking uh, a second before is very useful when you combine the typefaces. So 
if you see these are one pretty much different in proportion so we use uh when we try to combine different typefaces we use typefaces um, of the same size this way we can compare the proportions with the different letters and see how they fit uh, if they are much more aligned or they are similar they have tendency to get along more visually uh, for example this this probably will not get exact proportion matched and this is also not needed but we are trying to maybe come come close come close as much as possible uh, with it also when we are examining typefaces uh, uh, individual typefaces not just for combining we need to check for legibility and this is a good trick to check the legibility because uh, when we have let's say illusion one uh, sometimes the, these guys can uh, just look the same so uh, i l and it's yeah and number one it's totally the same if you put it everything in here uh, it's harder to distinguish the the letter forms it's not it's not a huge deal breaker but you have to think about it when you're designing for maybe a particular audience and overall legibility so legibility is uh, uh for a typeface is how much how easy can we decipher uh individual character in this case so is it clear that this is l or one so this is a low legibility typeface and this is like higher legibility typeface uh, it's not to confuse with readability readability is um do i want to read it i want to this is something that I uh, explained like that legibility. So heck, how can I decipher it? Can I decipher the, the individual letters? And the readability is, uh, is this pleasing enough for me to engage in that content? So readability has more with how we typeset it, how we arrange it, how we design the, the text. And the legibility is more of uh, with characteristics of uh, particular typeface. Um, this is not legibility, uh, it's uh, kerning. So also uh, needs trick to check the built-in kerning uh, within the typeface uh, because yeah, we can uh, maybe letter space, but this is not kerning. If we are doing, let's say uh, offline or, or branding or uh, print, then we have opportunity maybe to individually kern the, the 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 letters but or, or 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 combinations but for the most of the time or how the project or budget allows we will uh in best, best case just letter space the letters so it's important when we are examining the typeface that we will gonna buy in the future to check how does this built-in uh uh kerning uh, looks like and the, sec the, the next thing is the, the critics. Sometimes this is just a language support. Uh, this often, uh, this uh, happened quite often. This is my surname. Uh, on a lot of websites, uh, when I logged in as a user, I mean, now less and less, but still there are some websites that uh, haven't fixed that language support and they get this or maybe in a best, better scenario, a different uh, fallback typeface uh, uh, letter for, for the uh, special characters. And of course, uh, we need to think about the purpose. Uh, what I mean by purpose is uh, we have display typefaces and te uh, text typefaces. Display typefaces are meant to be used as uh, headlines or displays. They are not meant to be used on a small size some, uh, let's say, type specimens have um, like helpful tips how to use it. And they said, OK, for this typeface, don't use it below, let's say, 40 pix pixels or points or whatever. So they are ensuring that uh, you don't go overboard and try to use this as a body text because you will totally break the legibility and readability as well. So. Uh, think about the purpose when you are choosing typeface is this typeface for a headlines or this is a more for a body text uh, when you check the the the, the body text uh, try to see how it runs 
how the the uh, text is set on different sizes and see how does it feel when you are reading check the uh, word spacing uh, built-in uh, uh, not letter spacing kerning and see how does it feel um, most of the times uh, text typeface can be used for the headlines it's it's looking okay as you see in this example it's not something that is meant to be used but it can work if we are limited but a display typeface for a for a running text uh, doesn't make uh, doesn't make sense and check for details um some of the details um that are more for a typesetting um when you take for example a particular typeface they want to use for a project and you want to check for details and i'm more thinking about or talking about uh, punctuation details and these are more for let's say readability or just for common sense uh, when for example dashes check how the dashes not use them of course use them uh, purposefully on your project but check how they look because they also have different styles and different looks in a typefaces when you select typeface uh, you will see that they have uh, different um, styles of uh, hyphens, n dash, and m dash compared to other typefaces. So the the advice here is to use it correctly. So hyphen is for like combination of the words uh, or uh, multi-part words, as the so so called like cost effective, and dashes it's like range. We want to show the range, like working time or year or whatever. And, and M dash is, uh, can be used for a different purpose. One purpose is uh, like a pause. Uh, if you have a comma or parentheses, you can use uh, M dash, or it can be replaced as uh, this attribution for a quote. It's a different to see the size difference is from the hyphen m dash and m dash i will not share the shortcuts for these ones because i have creation keyboard uh, so just google it and you will find it uh, i was using for most of the time i couldn't i didn't know about the the exact shortcuts and then just find google it copy it and paste it while before i uh, learned it uh, the proper way the next thing uh, you need to be aware is uh, hang hanging punctuation. This is, I would say, self-explanatory. Uh, just see that this, the text is perfectly vertically aligned and it's easier to read. It doesn't break the flow and it's just not more, more pleasing for your eyes. And the final thing for, for this, let's say, uh, technical stuff is uh, try to use it these characters or, or uh, multipl multiplication or fraction symbols correctly uh, these are like wrong ways and good ways how to use it uh, if you are wondering where to find these you can find in figma on this additional thing these additional options and you will get the not for every typeface very depending on which typeface you you choose this is why you need to check uh, this technical stuff for typeface when you're choosing it for a white uh, project if this has uh, support for this kind of thing this is not for just for for fractions or or uh, numer numerals that is tabular or proportional and that also it's for ligatures or special characters or alternatives or all sorts of interesting things uh, inside of the um, the typeface and we are on the third part it's practice um, so this is for me the most important thing the practice is it's everything is about the practice knowledge that we learn or we we research or we combine doesn't make sense if you don't try it and try it out and and work on our skill so just practice uh, i use some sometimes uh, um, like a style board uh, for quickly comparing typefaces like let's say typesetting them to get the some kind of a overall feeling of a typeface how does it behave 
uh, how much can I extend it? And this is a lazy or quick way when I have multiple typefaces and I need to decide which one I want to use, which is more aligned with this vision or aesthetic uh, 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 point of view of a particular project. So this uh, type, type board, so call them, uh, is a good way to uh, pre-made them uh, and use them, use them whenever you find uh, interesting typeface that you already purchased or have a trial, just test it out. It doesn't take, take so much time uh, and you compare it with those findings from the mood boards or fonts in use and then you can get a good sense of uh, limitations and possibilities of uh, this, uh, let's say, particular typeface. Uh, yeah, this is a very good way of uh, uh, quickly seeing what the typeface is capable and what the look and feel uh, is it. Um, the next thing is typographic scale. I will not go so much into details or importance of a typographic scale. Uh, is it important or not? Um, I'm a, like a strong believer that um, any process needs to be clear, but also needs to be chaotic in a way. So also some people are very uh, are much uh, keen to have everything perfectly structured, aligned, and uh, predictable. But in a way, this predictability will give us average results. And other people want just chaos. Uh, without scale, without uh, hierarchy, without order, without organization. And this enables them to create more unexpected results different uh, designs, different uh, results, different feeling, different moods, personalities, whatever. Uh, I believe in balance, so you need to have both of them. So for typographic scales, I usually start project without typographic scale. I just design, 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 and then when I have enough elements and see the content, how it fits, and see how does it work, then I introduce the scale. So you can build your own scale or you can use existing solution. In the end, scale helps you to have some kind of a vertical rhythm, like consistency in your design, not just from a technical point of view to have a scale defined in your Figma and to ship it out to developers, but also for a consistency in design and overall feeling when you look at the, the whole project or whole design. So for typographic scale, my approach is to start working without it. And then in the, let's say, one third or one quarter of a project, I start to create a typographic scale and set it up and maybe just change it a while ago uh, uh, more to the end of the project. So I have more tendency to create my own scales because I'm much more comfortable. I have my own, let's say, rhythm. But also you can use like modular scale. Uh, it's a good, 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 good tool, and you can even change like uh, ratios and get different results of uh, let's say uh, relations of all typefaces and how they work. And you know, for me this is too much. Uh, um, sometimes I use it and I just cut some of them. Most of the time, it's just construct my own scale and uh, work, work the project. But yeah, this is regarding the scale. Uh, it's definitely good to have it by the end of the project or a must have because uh, uh, you don't want to have uh, problems for uh, maintaining that project or shipping up to developers or working with them. Same goes with the grid. So grid as itself, uh, there are pre-made solutions and they are like, your own solutions. Uh, the grid can be like, let's say, for any type of design, either that be a website, uh, app, uh, brochure, whatever, you can have your own grid. This is the base, most basic grid. This, this grid has two columns and has margins, and that's it. You align objects within that grid. Or maybe you just use three grids, and you have the same content, but just laid out differently. And in the end, you can all, you can create your own grid. So depending on the purpose of the project and the needs, you can just construct your own grid. 
same for me same as uh the typographic scale i start without the grid and then just arrange elements based on my gut feeling and how they feel and how they work and then impose or construct a grid um, back in the time i used to use uh 24 columns grid without the gutter that was my idea of a grid and i i like imagined that grid and it was like really really good grid but um but some time uh, all of the decision in the design became predictable and no matter how much i was breaking that grid um i didn't feel the that uh, it's in the right direction so i'm more of keen just to align things experiment and then set up a grid and construct it based on your needs if it is a tree is it a big uh, margin it is a smaller margin uh, whatever you need uh, but this is a very helpful to to organize your content uh, before we jump into qa i have just a second this shouldn't be here yeah we have some things uh workspace uh just to, just a second let me just check if there were any questions or comments uh michael you can join we have a lot of questions <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so maybe i will not uh, just uh, go into typesetting i will jump into questions maybe just quickly share my thinking in the typesetting uh when we are in, in figma and we need to uh, typeset something uh, everything so i started here working for this uh, course to or this presentation to have more examples that i just have these two uh but um you can just think of this as a, a setting type setting type uh is same like design you're using basic elements these elements are white space positioning size contrast color and it's similar with with typography when you are setting the the typefaces for example and we need to set something we need to have some kind of a uh, hierarchy so headline is too small we'll probably increase the headline or go bolder maybe use distance to emphasize it or maybe we will use positioning and use size even more let's check it out so we are playing around with different things in design to make difference between the elements that are important or to make information more readable or accessible let's this is 20 and we can go even more so basically when we are uh, this is something that i want to sh also show like example when we are working with paragraph this is a basic element we are always like all of these things that i'm talking here we are always trying to uh, design a paragraph so how much uh, line height versus line length is enough depending on your style you want to achieve maybe you are more in a brutalistic way and you you want to do a different style and you will break some rules and get a totally different feel and discard the natural ways of uh, aligning or principles but getting the different feel uh, in the end you are designing this individual element and then when you design this individual element this element fits with another element and how these elements work together and how they work with another element and how they work in a in a whole medium page or web or screens or more more in inverse but basically we are only using basic design elements so we're starting with paragraph and trying to find okay what is the right 
line length, uh, sorry, uh, letters, uh, line, uh, line height. So should it be more like uh, loose? This is not good because from even uh, usability perspective, it's harder to read when you need to go here and your eye needs to jump here and then here and it's harder. So there are some rules on the web. You can probably, you already know them and you can research them if you don't know them. Like so many characters are in this uh, line or this size. But basically you are playing with size, line height and uh, line length. I'm more of uh, setting it how it feels. Do I want to read it? Does it feel right compared to using the, the rules? And I'm trying to align them and give, give them like a uh, oddness. Yeah, but. <laughs> Kako? Relation, yeah. Relation. Yeah, with the blockade of Relation between them. Uh, that, that also, whenever we add element inside, they have some kind of a relation with other elements, and our assignment is to 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 make them work. It's hard when you have only few elements where you want to align them, how you want to uh, uh, let's say design them in which way. But it's even harder when you have a lot of elements, a lot of information, and they, there are a lot of combinations or relations, how they affect the overall design. But yeah, this is something that I wanted to, to just to show. Um, we're trying to uh, bring in the hierarchy between the elements and between the elements of the page, whether that from the size or the positioning or white space or whatever we're going to use, or we want to have a contrast. Contrast uh, can be also sold with here, this is a contrast between the size. Or if we don't have contrast in size, uh, maybe we'll have contrast in positioning uh, or uh, contrast in color or something. So we are basically using all of the basic design elements to get, get the feel. Sometimes it's just alignment or, I don't know, uh, whatever basic elements are there. Yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, we are good to go with the Q&A uh, part. I think a lot of questions were there. I was not, not just uh, um, checking this was just into my slides and I felt like alone. So go. Uh, so if you can maybe switch just to go back to the uh, Figma. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you something before we start uh, doing this. So. Uh, on that example, which you had paragraphs, so never mind. Uh, ah, yeah. Paragraphs, sure. Uh, workspace. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I wanted to ask, wanted to ask you, you know, you know, uh, for example, if you create uh, some sort of uh, typographical hierarchy, and uh, if you do it, you know, just by the feel, and how do you impose? Uh, line height to the, uh, for example, baseline grid later. Do you, do you yeah. tweak it or do you just tweak or if it's for four pixel grid or eight pixel grid or six, whatever. So do you uh, like create that uh, tweaking process of line height after the, the, the over this, this whole process of. Yeah, um, I start with just going with my gut feeling just uh, trying to figure out what works and what are the relationships between those elements and how much sizes do I have, what works and what's the overall, let's say, uh, vibe or let's say feeling of a project. And then uh, I just, let's say, uh, adjust the spacing from just um, like how it feels and later on, I translate it into a more concrete uh, relations. For example, you ask, do I force the grid? Sometimes I just don't care about the grid for the a vertical space because, yeah, if we are working on a, on a web, it's like, you know, all the browsers tend to have different uh, relations and it's hard to force everything on a baseline and 
there are a lot of let's say plugins and workarounds and i'm not that meticulous i'm more into let's find appropriate typeface that communicates a right message and it has a te technical uh uh let's say technical things that are good and works together and then try to find the look and feel the relations between the let's say line height the the numerals and uh, let's say technical stuff and then clean clean it up and i then clean it up and impose some kind of a structure grid or whatever for this let's say presentation i was just let's say i started with body text and just quickly created for myself a small um uh, this uh, fucker uh hierarchy or mm -hmm. here just a second he so i have a small uh styles for this grid and how they created i just started to, to check first experimented went into graveyard and experimented try to find the the right uh, balance combination see the structure of the, of the whole presentation in this case i try to different combinations and see okay these are some kind of a you know just forcefully tweaked that's something that you don't need don't ever do uh just you know find the right balance and okay this is something that is a style starting point for example and then let's divide this for on a let's say golden ratio and get uh, a second value and second 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 so this was a i didn't have time to go more into details and this is the way how i created for this quick project uh, <laughs> for create this pre presentation for 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 this purpose great Thanks for your insight. So um, now we can go to to Q and A from people. Uh, a lot of Q and A. So basically, the first one would be from John. What type of programs do you recommend to organize fonts? So we can we go back to the, to the start of, start of our presentation. Uh, programs uh, I use uh, font book. This is for Mac but this is not for organization this is just for you know uh enabling them on a, on a machine or disabling or, or checking some some things i'm i'm using uh evernote for structuring these these guys uh for me this is like a note sometimes i uh, use google drive and where is that evernote fucker yeah here Mm -hmm. yeah this is for me this works you know um, i have like uh, groups of typefaces that are uh, within some you know uh, groups or folders and then i have links to that websites or even foundries in in this way uh when i also have downloaded or bought typefaces i just keep them in folder don't have any better organization for that and also on pinterest for inspiration when i try to find okay uh typefaces for ui or typefaces for headline or very expressive typefaces this is something that i use uh just for organization in times in terms of software evernote notion also i most of my thing is is on evernote so i just transferred part of the things on notion and it's still not uh organize i as i want to have it so basically uh th that's for organizing the, the the links but what about like physical fonts on your machine do you have any where you know like uh, uh where you can sort or create categories and uh, so for no i use figma yeah. i use figma for that I, I just keep it in folders keep it simple uh on, like, you know i have like, sweet series sun series and yeah, yeah, some serif, serif uh, display typefaces, blah, blah, blah. And then these are my go to folders when I dig around. First, I go Evernote. Okay, I see these ones, click links, open up, examine them, see the, the this uh, uh, type mood boards. When I choose if I have them, it's harder to search there, but sometimes I just go there and I keep everything in Figma as well, like inspiration and also typefaces, just testing them okay so the, the other question is do you use digital tools for typeface recognition and if you do which of them are 
the most credible and useful for you? Uh, I don't use. Uh, I heard for some, but I tried to use them in the past, but that was like ten years ago. <laughs> Maybe they are they became better. Uh, uh, what the font or something like that was called. I don't use them. I'm more trying to uh, uh, try to find out which typeface it, it is. Uh, yeah, I use uh, when I when I'm on website, I use what the font and font ninja. These two mm -hmm. plugins for Chrome are useful. When you are on website, you can examine or inspect the typeface and you can get ex exact name. But when I'm on, let's say, examine the print design, I'm trying to figure out. I, it's hard to. Most of the fonts I can recognize that are popular, like majority of them. But some that are like more uh, neutral and harder to recognize. At least I try to categorize them. Uh, try to figure out the origin or classification of them and put them in some kind of a category. It's hard to know know every font uh, what's the name. Yeah. Uh, so the other question would be any recommendations for great typography guidelines, examples, brand, brand guidelines in general? Oh, you found me in this one. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, probably there are somewhere. I, uh, I would need to check my inspiration folder. Probably I had some branding guidelines, and then there's a site that has branding guidelines examples. I remember something from there. Uh, shoot me up uh, somewhere on social media, and I will send you if I remember. I don't know from top of my head. Sometimes the the under consideration, uh, they also uh, were examining the typefaces, but now they're not free anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, David asked, uh, have you had any experience uh, that some expensive font fits the project like perfectly, but the client refuses, of course, to pay for it? And how do you pursue them and uh, how do you like... Yeah, this is a hard, hard game as well. Uh, uh, I would say the best way is to set up expectations in the beginning of the project and say this is very vital. Uh, so, like a lot of you have a lot of uh, situations where clients says, okay, just use Google fonts. I'm not against the Google fonts. There, I had some project that I needed to just use the Google fonts and like a lot of them, and really went into research and find really really nice ones and but really really you know quality and technical and aesthetic point of view, but. The good good way to solve this, or at least try to solve this, try to uh, explain the client the this aesthetic part, why this is important, and most of the typefaces on certain type foundries have a certain aesthetic, and this aesthetic needs to reflect your brand. And if your brand wants to uh, be like every other brand, it's okay to use every other typeface and not to differentiate. But if you want to differentiate, this is the value of a uh, maybe more unique approach or at least more 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 not so used uh, uh, typeface. So this is the something that something is this is discussed in the beginning of the project and set up a budget for a typeface. Uh, especially we had a lot of uh, situations where uh, the budget for the typeface can very go can increase. Because the client is using typeface for uh, multiple purposes, and then they have have to pay a lot of money to use it. So then there's, there is a, some kind of a back and forth between the affordance and let's say uh, technical characteristic of that font and aesthetic uh, value of that font. So it's a combination. But yeah, best is to just to try to upfront talk with client with it because. If you do it while you're starting the design and you're presenting design, then it's too late. It's harder to win that battle. Okay, thanks. So uh, we have some other also. Uh, Mario asked, hi, Mario. Uh, can you share some quick tips for proper type face pairing? Mm, actually, I have a, a whole course about it uh, on the words. So you can check it out. This is a, a plug. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if it's still in a prepaid, but it's 
kind of uh, something similar that I presented here, but more into details. Uh, but some quick share, uh, tips for combining typefaces, right? That was the question. Yeah. So uh, quick ones, like strategies would be uh, try to aim for contrast stylistically, sans serif serif. This is like most common advice and I hate it, but yeah, this is because sometimes it doesn't work if you fall, if you use a typeface for a different period or different classification or different form, but this is a good approach, like a safe one. Other safe approach is, as I mentioned, try to combine typefaces from the same foundry. So let's say you select one type foundry, find a typeface and then try to find type two typefaces from that type foundry it's more likely that they will match together and even more you can try to see the designer or type designer that created typeface try to to combine typeface from the same designer these are the like quick tips or strategies where you don't have time to examine the classification or structure or the form or proportion or, or other things that um, we discussed you don't have time and it's a okay kind of strategy not to to have like uh, average results yeah great yeah so uh, i don't uh, so just a second uh okay someone asked what are the best uh websites where we can find cool and free typefaces google phones so Anna answered some of them but you can uh, fill, fill fill that in uh, yeah, Google Fonts and uh, I think uh, Velvet in Type Foundry has, it's an interesting Type Foundry, but has a, a particular aesthetic. It's not for <laughs> everyday use. Uh, it's it's okay to, to, let's say, go there if you can find a font that, or typeface that uh, matches your uh, brand uh, communication or you feeling you want to achieve. But yeah, the, the, I would say best uh, source for free typefaces uh, that are also have decent quality is Google Fonts. They are open sourced. I'm not sure about type kit. They had before some kind of uh, free packages. I'm not yeah. sure that that's anymore. And I think Awards has also like a list of uh, free fonts. And uh, I don't know how it's called. We work for them or work we something like that we work for them yeah they also have some kind of a free uh fonts and as well you can check if you go really deep into behance some type designers are publishing free let's say a few widths of a particular font or even a whole family of a font they want to let's say contribute or maybe just to be uh heard about it and yeah position yourself as a type designer so yeah, you work for them. Yeah, 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 something like that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dark. Uh, so uh, since we uh, talk about uh, free and paid uh, uh, typefaces or fonts, uh, what do you think about current state of font licensing? It's pretty much confu not confusing, but I don't think it, it they catch up, you know, to to the whole. Uh, process of digitalization and uh, to you know the expense of websites because the, the it's it's you know some say you know the, the font is the, the fonts are too expensive uh, for the license they uh, give to the people you know yeah um, are... yeah it's a great question I have thoughts about it uh, they're not expensive because it's a hard work to do to create a font it's intellectual property and it's very hard uh, meticulous work uh, uh, but they are confusing in terms of licensing uh, they are hard to understand and really most of the type foundries have from the classification they are having classification different and also the licenses you need really to be aware of the licensing because you can have uh, legal issues if you use a particular license for a purpose that is not meant. For example, if you are designing for a web and you will use a web license for that web that will be hosted in your server, 
but you are designing that in Figma, you need to have both li licenses, desktop and uh, web license. And yeah. especially if you are maybe uh, having a design for a t-shirt or whatever, and this will be sold, it has a different license. And there's a lot of licensing on different type foundries. So every type foundry has a licensing kind of licensing system for itself. Uh, some of them have this more clear and easy straightforward. Some of them more complicated, but you should definitely read that. I really like the ones that are, uh, let's say, uh, killing the game and they are thinking in upfront. They are having this approach to maybe publishing multiple typefaces to maybe have different vibe of a typefaces because the the need of that is bigger and design is changing and the trends are changing and they are wanted to jump on this ship and influence that and they say okay this is our approach and then we will find we will create a licensing system that is simple to use for example a swiss type foundry has a great system and they say okay buy a license and this is forever for any project yeah. for any purpose for anything and that's it this is something that is like wow super nice yeah. and they for me this is like also like getting a font for free it's like i don't know 50 60 euros uh uh a uh, weight and for this kind of licensing this really it's like like a big thing for for designers yeah i agree with that uh, i was also uh, wanted to mention their their license uh, because uh, i think that that's something that really relates to the modern you know approach of building the, the websites uh and uh, since we're also talking about uh, fonts what do you think about uh, variable fonts it's something new it's something you know which is coming uh, I, I sort of I took a few fonts and played with them and uh, it's really like game changing <laughs> so, and, yeah definitely. Uh, you... definitely uh also i have a love and hate relationship with them uh we <laughs> use on some projects and we try to maybe uh extend their use maybe to combine interaction and animation with the with the variable and it's nice when you so you have a lot of options i'm not this is what i like but also i don't i hate it at the same time because a lot of options give you uh like a per, per, you get paralyzed with a lot of options. So you, should I go this and this, or how should I typeset it? And then if you know, don't know what you're doing, it's just you, you, you're wasting time. And for some purposes, it's perfect because you can quick, you know, if you have your purpose in your, in your mind for a project and you are searching for a particular weight style or whatever, then you can, well, variable fonts are perfect for that and it's great but if you're using variable fonts for as a starting point to create something and impose some kind of a system then you are just having too much options and then you you are you are getting paralyzed like uh, you're wasting time and just exploring so many different options and you don't have maybe so much constraints on your project or design and constraints are good in a way uh, either from the client or the user or, or the project or the funds or whatever so in a way yeah maybe it's, it's done mostly to to uh decrease the bandwidth uh, and uh, you know for for from development perspective yeah for the technical point of view this is great they are like i don't know few times uh, lower in bandwidth and but also i'm thinking we live at, at least most of us live I'm not talking about uh, not undeveloped uh, uh, areas. So this is also, when you are searching for typeface, look for the purpose. If the purpose is, we are gonna use it in this Central European area, or I mean, it's web, it's wide, but most of our customer or target customers are from this area, then it's not a big uh, helper to get decreased in some few uh, bytes of, of size. But in a way, somewhere it can be very, very crucial. So yeah, this use it with purpose. I would say. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, Kronoslav also mentioned. Do you have any thoughts on future fonts? X X Y dot X Y Z. I don't know. Have you heard? I, I'll open the. Uh, okay. 
two spots. I thought I saw this also. Uh, it's also some sort of uh, foundry, but or like a marketplace maybe for funds for for foundries. Have you heard about it? No. Or no, I mean, have... it sounds familiar, but I haven't uh, thought it. If this is a, something for like a marketplace, yeah, why not? Yeah. I think everything has uh, its audience. So for some for some Google fonts is a great source. Uh, there's audience for that. There's also clients for that. For others, there's our very expensive type founder that they put a lot of effort in building their fonts. And for others, it's something like, like more contemporary or I don't know, different, maybe look and feel aesthetic or open source. Yeah, it, depending on the more the merrier, I would say. Yeah, it's just giving the variety in, in the market. So this is the future fonts. Yeah. I don't know. Uh... Ah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely interesting. Yeah. If if it, this is moving uh let's say in, in a good direction of the community of the type designers to create more and maybe to to uh, publish more and, and give uh to be more accessible to designers, why not? In other ways, like everything it has some downsides, you know, we are simplifying the the process of making fonts and maybe going into shortcuts or certain aesthetics but yeah and but like everything in life it has two two variants yeah. and just one for for like for maybe a conclusion uh on the q a uh part so uh, what do you think what drives uh new uh, uh, uh what <laughs> Uh, what drives new fonts or new typography uh, uh, for for uh, like whole community? What drives them, you know, to use series or some series or to, like what's modern today, the grotesque or you know? Uh, so for, for example, now the, the some we see like rise of the slave fonts uh, on the market and on the websites. And what do you think? Uh, what drives that? You know, are they are this like something that uh, foundries are just doing, or the community is just like sick of using sensory uh, fonts? Yeah, it's the both ways. It's the trend. Uh, it's a psychological uh, psychological effect. So it's same in fashion. So when you look at the fashion, everything is uh, going in circles. So everything is going back. So you need some kind of a change, and that change comes from the when you are looking at the things that are same all the time. So you need you want to differentiate, you want to stand out from the sameness, and this is how the the styles or needs are evolving. And when the one need evolves and maybe changes, then the rest are trying starting to follow. And there will always be the, the ones that are like pushing the limits and are the ones that are uh, up front and the others that are following. And this is the following is the whole industry and the, let's say community. And for example, now if the serif fonts are uh, very popular, this is the something that is maybe was popular for somebody that is very into it. And so that this trend could arise and then now it's popular and then it's having the mass market. And this is normal. This is same like in design style and in fashion. Everything goes around, but it changes a bit. Now, like in fashion, for some quite a while, it's like the 90s. You have a great influence, but still it's different than the actual 90s. I was like, I was a child from the 80s and I, I was like dressing, dressed like that. And I was popular then now, um, but in a way, it changes a bit for this this part and it's this is a normal it mimics. yeah it mimics in definitely and yeah this this is something that is that we are seeing in in every aspect of creative uh area with the fashion or typography or design or whatever arts we are always seeing new trends arising and then there are some people who are 
you know, see that trends because they understand how from where they come and they see the seamless and they are trying to break out and the, they are the ones that they're breaking out and then the rest are following. And when the critical mass appears and then a lot of people are following, then they're breaking out of that and they are always using some kind of a reference from before or influences from before. Yeah, so we basically, we're uh, all the time iterating the whole process, but uh, also uh, we enhance it all uh, yes. in, in, in the next iterations from, from the past. We can say it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if if uh, no one, I think, has any questions. Yeah, I would leave you uh, with, we can... with one thing just yeah. uh, regards of this inspiration and practical stuff. Um, we were discuss I was discussing, <laughs> we were discussing, I was having a monologue with myself about about the practice so to seeing to to develop that skill or this uh, aesthetic or this feeling gut feeling to to know and understand the technical variations we need to practice we need to have everything that we learned and everything that we put in our inspirational mind or subconscious we need to try to practice we need to try to work on that craft on that skill and if we work uh, if we ins inspire ourselves too much and we don't work we get a gap and this is explained much better than me in one video from ira glazer i will show it uh, here and yeah thank you for that uh, michael this this is uh, my course on awards it goes more into details on this subject and has these uh, parts that i didn't mention here about uh, classifying typefaces uh, combining them and working with type in general and this uh link is about uh the gap by era glass and yeah it's like two minutes video that very nicely explains why this gap happens and why it's very important to work or to try or to experiment because only thing that we will get out of it if we don't do it is frustration and we will we could recognize good work we can see what works what is aesthetically pleasing but we cannot produce it uh, in the end yeah i would leave it with this Thank you, Mario. It, it was really a pleasure to have you uh, here. Uh, I don't know, do you, do you uh, have uh, anything else to say? So, uh, you know, we're always glad to hear some of your thoughts and your perspective on, on the whole UI design process. And uh, of course, the color free, UX, uh, and everything else. And, uh, you know, we, We'll see it soon again. Sometimes, maybe uh, live or in physical hopefully, <laughs> form. Hopefully, looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm stuck here. Yeah. In, so, uh, <laughs> like everybody else. Yeah, yeah. That's this is the future right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically, uh, yeah. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I hope you had a great time. Uh, I hope you learn. Uh, I, I think you learned uh, something new, and uh, you, or just check your knowledge again. And uh, we'll see you again soon uh, with some new topics and uh, some new speakers. And until then, stay safe and uh, have yeah, fun. Thank you so much. For Bye, everyone. Me. Bye.